Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast is a Christ-centered podcast established in 2019 and hosted weekly by Pastor Chris Busher, addressing a host of topics such as the Great Commission, Christian discipleship, and often featuring interviews with special guests who are experts in their field. The views and events expressed on this podcast and all related materials belong solely to their author and not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual. While all attempts are made to present accurate information, some information may become outdated over time. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast makes every attempt to timely update any and all such information. Without further delay, here's another powerful episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Once again, my name is Dallas Montague. Today, we have another wonderful guest, Julius Mosley. Julius, how are you today? I'm very good, Dallas. Very good. I've been looking forward to meeting with you and talking with you. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I know our audience are going to be blessed by our conversation today. You have a book called Living Life with Blinders On or Living Life as God Intended. And I was telling you before we started our recording here that this is such an important topic for our culture today, for our generations to understand. So many people live with their blinders on, whether that's living in condemnation, maybe they're fearful of God, maybe they have guilt from their sin that they haven't been redeemed from or forgiven from, or maybe we don't have a complete understanding of who God is. There's so many ways that we can break this down living life with blinders on. And so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say for our audience. But before we get into that, I just want to give you a few minutes. Tell us about who you are, Julius, your testimony with the Lord, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, currently I'm a practicing dentist. I've been practicing for the last 40 plus years. Um, But prior to that, it has always been a desire on my part, starting in the fourth grade, to become a dentist. But all at the same time, there was a a yearning on the inside of me and kind of like a fear that I was aware of things that my my schoolmates seemed not to be aware of. I was a little conscious about life and death. I saw people dying around me, uh, both young and old. And in my community, there's a church that uh, every time a person died, uh, the church bell tolled. And so everyone would run up to the church with small kids, run to the church and find out who was it that just died. And sometimes we kind of expected it. And on other occasions, we didn't expect it. And that created kind of a fear, a fear of dying, because I didn't know where these people were going. No one had any answers, even members of the church. And I was only eight or nine years old. So that was a fearful time for me. Because I thought about those things. Uh, Where are these people going? No one wants to talk about it. They want to talk about how great life that they live, uh, how they did live so well, and and they gave all these accolades. But no one told me or were able to tell me what was beyond the grave. And that was the question that I wanted to know. I I was not a slow student in school to begin with. I was kind of a little smart kid at the top of my class and all through uh, secondary school and going in high school. And I began to think, I said, did did God dislike me so that I'm I'm so smart that I cannot understand how people are saved? Because uh, there has to be something beyond the grave. And I just could not believe that a God would create human beings, allow them to live in this world, enjoy the benefits and fruit of this world, and then die and never be thought of again. It just didn't sit well with me. I had to know a little bit more than that. I had sisters and brothers uh, uh, that was a little older than myself and some were younger and they went to church, they joined the church, said that they were saved and uh, it skipped over me. And they said, well, when are you gonna join the church? I said, but I don't know what I'm doing. And so why should I join the church if I don't know what I'm doing? And I said, tell me, why did you join the church? And they gave me all various reasons, and those reasons were unacceptable. I said, it's got to be something more than that. I said, where is that the God connection? I saw all that you did was join the church. So it took me a while. And uh, 
the day finally came, you know, I had asked people to pray for me. Remember, good, I call reputable members in the church to pray for me, to ask God to share with me how people are really saved. One day I was walking, I was working in a nursery, a fruit and um, nut nursery. We were grafting trees and we were coming in for lunch. And I had a cousin who was younger than me that was grafting trees right along beside me. And he looked at me and he said, uh, he called my name. He said, what is it that you don't understand about being saved? I said, I just want to know how to be saved. And, and he quickly said, well, don't you believe? That was the first time that that word had ever hit me. And I said, yes, yes, I believe. I believe. And then I began to confess. I saw all these other times. I really was, I was happy, elated, but at the same time, I was saddened. Because I knew that a lot of people had not understood salvation. Mm. And it took me a while to understand it. But then when I became saved again to study the scriptures, I began to see all places in scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave its only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, that word believe came again. And Romans 1, 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation for everyone that believes. Mm-hmm. For the preaching of the cross, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for those who perish is foolishness, for those that are saved, it is the power of God to all that believe. And that word came over and over and over again. I knew that I had it. I knew that I was born again. You're listening to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. We'll be right back after this quick word from our sponsors. This book here, and what led you to want to write this book? Because there's many Christians out there, many people who give their lives to Jesus, but they don't write books. And so what led you to to release this book? Well, as I grew up, in the many organizations that I, I was a part of, my colleagues, friends, uh, They seem not to care about what I considered the most important thing in life. And that was, where are you going when you die? They were enjoying life. They talk about all kinds of things, which to me was not that important. Mm -hmm. I know about these things already. I went to school. I learned the same thing that you learned. But you don't seem to be concerned about the most important thing in life. And that is... What's going to happen when you die? So I was one of those persons that people tried to stay away from because they didn't want to hear that Jesus talk. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I couldn't help that. Uh, if I see a person who know not Christ, in some way, I'm going to try to get you around to understanding that there is a God. And maybe if you understood a little bit more, that there's really two gods and that God Second God is Satan, and he's the God of this world that you need to understand. So what I decided to do, since I was not getting satisfied in a lot of churches that I was members of, I said, I got to reach the laws for Christ. I got to reach the laws for Christ, not just people within my church, but people around the world. So I decided that I'd write a book. Now, I had been writing this book for about two years. Uh, when I got an opportunity to do, I would sit and write. But when the pandemic set in, and I saw the number of people that were dying on a daily basis around the world, and it had reached 500,000 right here in this country, I said, I cannot wait any longer. The doors of the church have been closed because of the pandemic. And uh, in church, I did teach class on evangelism and discipleship, on visitation. Uh, But even members of the church, many of them was not that interested in learning how to share the gospel. It seemed as if they were saying, I got it and you get it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's not the commandment that our Lord had given us. He said, go ye therefore and share the gospel, not come ye 
not come in the, into the church to share the gospel, but we are to go out. So that was the genesis of the book. When people start dying like flies around the world, I began to write. Everything that came to my mind that was on my heart, I would get up two and three o'clock in the morning and I would just write. I would just write uh, until it disappeared and I'd get back into bed. My wife told me, cut the light off in the bed. I said, well, I'm finished for tonight. I said, whatever that was on my mind, I have written it down. Mm -hmm. And I kept writing until I reached a point and I was satisfied when I put the gospel down the last page, I wrote amen. And I don't wonder why in the world did I write amen. I, you know, that was not my doing. It said amen. And I stopped. I said, this is it. I'm going to get it to the publisher and see if we can get it uh, uh, published and see if I can get it to as many people who have ears to hear. Mm. Let them hear. I don't want to take away from what you're saying because it's so incredible, but I do want to add one one personal thought here that it's easy for us to compare our end time Christianity today, 2022 with the disaster of the Titanic and stay with me here. I got to play it. Okay. The disaster of the Titanic and with the Titanic, first off, they didn't have enough lifeboats, right? They could only fit about two third of the people on the boats. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a disaster right there. And then after the disaster happened, they hit the, the iceberg and people were getting inside of the boats. They weren't even filling up the lifeboats to full capacity. They could fit about 70 people, but they were, it's recorded only about 15 to 30 were being filled inside of the lifeboats. And wow. those people in the lifeboats were fleeing from the disaster like we do as humans. When there's a disaster, we get the heck out of there. That's normal. Yeah. But what those people forgot is that there were hundreds of other people, 2,001 total on the Titanic, hundreds in the water, drowning, dying in that cold water. And the people in the lifeboats forgot that they had the answer to their problem. They have a yeah. boat, but they left forgetting that they could help those people. And that's something that I preach here in Brazil is that in today... In 2022, we are those people on the lifeboat. We are the saved believers of God. When we die, we're going to heaven. However, right. we're so pleased and so happy that we're saved that we forget about all the other people around us that are dying every single day. And we don't, we, we forget that we have the answer, that Jesus is the answer. He's the hope that we right. have. And, and we're so blessed. We're so happy. We go to church. We raise our hands. Yes, I'm saved. Right. I'm, I'm free from the disaster. But we need to be those people. There's another story of the Titanic of a man evangelist who's on the Titanic, and that's a story for another day. However, he spent the last life, the last few minutes of his life, hours of his life, ministering, telling people to believe in Jesus and they'll be saved. And so, not to take away from what you're saying there, but I think that's a, a beautiful picture for our audience that we forget as believers. We think that church right. is designed to serve us. However, we're right. designed to serve others, right? Right. That's the right. design. Right. Right. So, Living life with blinders on. I think that's such an amazing topic. Another question I have for you is, what does this, can you define this for me? Living life as God intended. What does that mean to you? Well, <clears throat> oftentimes as believers, uh, the churches that I have attended, uh, very few churches, uh, to me, were not really following the scriptures. Uh, because the first thing that a person should recognize and should be taught as a believer, God said, make disciples. And in making disciples, the moment that we are born again, we become babes all over again. Mm -hmm. We become spiritual babes. And as spiritual babes, just like as physical babes, we need food to grow. And with physical food, we grow. We're going to grow anyway. Whether you eat food or not, you're going to starve or uh, grow anyway. But spiritual growth requires the word of God to grow. Mm -hmm. Christ tells us in 2 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So God is telling us, if you place the pastor in a church and you understand what God has called you to do, he's dependent upon you. For all these new Christians, they are babes in Christ, mm -hmm. and they need to be taught the Word of God, starting out with the simple things of the Word of God. 
But one of the most compelling things is that recognizing that you are a new creation, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, any man in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we need to be taught, even as babes in Christ, to share your faith. But you got to be taught. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to convict people, not what you say and not what I say. Those are called cor uh, corruptible words. But God said, we are saved by the incorruptible God word, which is the word of God. So we need to learn the appropriate scripture to share with people such that the Holy Spirit can convict men and women what God say, how a person is saved. So within a church, you start out with the babes in Christ, teaching the basic fundamentals of your faith, and then helping them to understand we have to live by faith and not by sight. Well, what does that mean? Living by faith and not by sight. The scripture tells us that God is the author of our faith. If he's the author of a faith, he said that the scripture was not written by men, but holy men of God was moved as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is the word of God. Mm -hmm. First thing we must learn that the Bible is the word of God. Not what I say, not what the pastors say, not what your members say, but I must see it in the word of God. And we have no excuse in this country for not reading the word of God because you can find the Bible almost everywhere you go. Even in hotels, you can find the Bible. Uh, so there's no reason that we should not read the Bible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Believers has been placed here with special gifts. The pastor has been given to equip the saints for work of ministry. But we need to make certain that walking by faith is walking by what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you through the word of God. Holy Spirit, through the word of God, not by sight, but by faith, using our natural abilities of sight, taste, smell, hearing, is not walking by faith. That's foolishness. If we think that we can understand God using our physical senses, well, you're absolutely wrong. God is a spirit. He requires a spirit within you to understand the thing that are written by the spirit, then you can respond to him properly. So walking by faith is to live by the word of God. And that takes us into this question here that says, why is it important for believers to live by spiritual awareness? Because it's not by our senses, it's by the spirit. So why is it important for us to have spiritual awareness? Well, it's because God lives in the spiritual world. There are two worlds that we live in. We live in the physical world, and a spiritual world. And in order for us to understand and relate to God, just as God told the woman at the well, when she said that uh, we worship in this mountain, and some said that they're worshiping that, that mountain, Christ said that you worship who you know not. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So basically what God Christ was saying to her, you must have the spirit of God in you to worship God who is spirit. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the light. Well, he told her two things. To worship God, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth is the word of God. He said, I am truth. The spirit is the spirit of God. You must have both to worship God who is a spirit. And you see, so unless you understand that, your worship could be in vain because you worship a God that you have created in your mind, which is the same thing that happened to Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel have been told the proper way to worship God. 
Abel bought the proper sacrifice. Cain did not. God accepted Abel, worship sacrifice, but he did not accept Cain. It's the same thing today. Disobedience. Disobedience as a how we approach God. God said, present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is the least that you can do. So he began to tell us that our bodies are tempered of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he reside within the spirit. He said, if man, any man has not the spirit of Christ, He's not of his. Well, God is just telling us that tabernacle that he saw and gave instruction in the Old Testament, the outer court, the inner court, and the holy to hold the room where God reside on a Shekinah glory. It's the same temple now. He said, I no longer live in temples made by hand. The temple now is the, the body of believers. The outer court the body, the inner court, the soul, and the inner God reside in the inner most inner court, which is the spirit. It's the same thing, but it's disobedience. We need to understand that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Right. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not obey God, when we do things that we want to do and not the things that our Lord has commanded us to do. And that affects every aspect of our life, whether it's marriage, divorce, finances, schooling, what you listen to, what you uh, play with, uh, your activities, mm -hmm. everything in your life, God has principles in the scripture that you are to live by. And you need to be told that. And pastors need to tell his parishioners that this is what God expects for you. Everything that is in the word of God apply to you. And you need to understand how it applies to you so that you can live a life that's well-pleasing to God. I want to give another question for you, for our audience, a practical step to take off our blinders and to remove these things that are unpleasing to the Lord. Well, the first thing that we got to do is we first got to trust God. You trust God by trusting what he has said in the Bible. The Bible is essential. You cannot get right with God, do anything with God. You cannot remove the blindness from your eyes until you start reading the word of God. It's not going to come any other way. As you read the word of God, we have to remember the Lord Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. Of sin because you believe not on me. Of judgment because the God of this world has been judged already. That's Satan. And of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So now if we back that up, we see God said, the Lord Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is coming and he's here. And the purpose of him being here is to make you feel guilty of the things that you've done, the thing that you should have done, and the things that you didn't do. That's sin. He convicts you of sin. And the sin, the greatest sin that you have any person has on the planet earth is a sin of unbelief. He said, of sin because you believe not on me. When Christ died on the cross, his shed blood was to pay for the sin of the entire world. Every person's sin has been paid for, both past, present, and future. The only sin that God, Christ, could not pay for was a sin of unbelief. And that's the sin that would take you into the judgment and it'd take you into the lake of fire. But mind you, he said, the Holy Spirit will convict you of the righteousness of God. And he said, the righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. 
So the righteousness of God is not a behavior. The righteousness of God is a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot satisfy God unless you take, appropriate what Christ has done in the cross, believe it and accept it as your method of pleasing a holy God. So taking blindness off your eyes, you must understand only the word of God is going to help you remove those words, those blindness from your eyes. I can't do it. You can't do it. No one can do it. Only the Holy Spirit can open up your eyes that you can see and understand what thus says the Lord. I like what you said here. He's not just a God. He's a holy God. The only one found worthy, a holy God. And yes. I think that's important to remember that we serve a holy God. There's no darkness in him. He's unwavering, unchanging. He will always stay the same. He is, he's holy. And yes. I can take comfort in that, you know, man, this is 2022. There's so many things happening in our world, but man, my God is holy, you know, that's yes, so good. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, Dallas is that. I like to share with people a deeper understanding. The Lord Jesus and the disciples asked Christ to teach us how to pray. Yeah. And he told them, our father, our father. See, God desires a relationship. But many Christians think being saved they have turned it into a religion, mm. just like any other faith that's out there. You call the name of Catholicism, uh, Mormonism, all religions. But they forgot that Satan, Christ told Peter, that Satan was a master deceiver. Such as, if he could deceive you, what do you think that he can do to the church? He said, told Peter, Satan desired to sift you like wheat. You're no match for him. So the church has brought religion into the church. Being born again is a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not singing and shouting and praying and Bible studying, the usher, all of the things that we do in the church. We are to obey God. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. John told us in 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, that our eyes have looked upon and our hands have handled the very word of God. He said, believe this. Believe this so that you would have fellowship with us and below that fellowship with our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. See, God wants a relationship. He's your Father. He looks after his children. Christ told the people that he were talking to, he said, ye are of your father, the devil. You see, there is a relationship. Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. And that needs to be made very clear so people understand that you're dealing with the God. Yes, he's a God, your creator. And he's a jealous God because he told you that. In Exodus 5.20, he said, For the Lord thy God is a jealous God, and he would not share his glory with no one. He's still God, but he still wants a relationship. He's your children. We are his children. And Christ said that he was not ashamed to call us brethren. So we need to understand it. He's a loving father. It's wonderful. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us about your book today? Well, with the book, the book is really based upon salvation, how a person can be born again. I try to reach people as to where they are right now, because you can identify the things that was talked about in the Bible. I mean, in the book, I understood very clearly that God said that the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, 
of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know it because it's spiritually understood. And so when I look at how Christ came to people and he started out in the physical, he met the woman at the well, he talked about water. Uh, he fed the uh, 5,000 food. You know, he started where they were on the physical side of man to switch them into the spiritual side of man. So the book, I try to get people to understand that you're really in a curse. You were cursed in the garden. You inherited a curse from your first parent, Adam. And it is still present with us today because the curse said that you were going to grow old and die. And people are growing old and they're dying. The curse to the woman is that she, she will have birth pain and she's still having birth pain. The curse to the serpent is that he will crawl on his belly. Snakes crawl on his belly. So we're trying to get them to physically see many of the things that God wants you to see so we can then begin to look at the spiritual side of it. You can't worship God. You do have a spirit, but the spirit will worship. You either worship yourself the God of your making, or the God of this world. And all of the things that you see with your eye are not the things that God put you there to see. They were put there by Satan. Movies, entertainment, enjoying life, job, politician, all of this was put there by Satan. TV, all of the different platforms that you see in there was put there by Satan to trap you. Because God said, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, if you be lost, the God of this world has blinded the eyes that you see not. So if you're trying to relate to God, so the book is trying to help you understand that you are the way that you are because of the curse that was placed on you that you inherited from your first parent, Adam. And that if you die in the line of Adam, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and the lake of fire is where you headed. So you must be born again. That first birth is insufficient because that first birth carried with it a curse. The second birth carried with it liberty. It carried with it eternal life. So you must be born again. You must have a spiritual birth. That spiritual birth come from above. The physical birth comes from below. And it books tells you exactly what you must understand. And once you understand it, how to appropriate what you've understood and invite Christ into your life. That's what the book is all about. Salvation. Thank you so much for all the things that you shared today. Where can we find this book? Where can our audience purchase it at? Well, the book can be found almost, you can Google the book. Uh, Living Life with Blinders On, YouTube, Google, any of the platform, uh, uh, Facebook, all of them, you can Google it. Uh, YouTube is a great area that you can Google it on because there is Amazon. There's mm -hmm. other, it tells you all of the bookstores that you can purchase on. But the moment that you type in YouTube and Living Life with Blinders On, a whole list of places pop up that okay. you can purchase the book, Living Life Through Blindness Zone. So I wish people would get it, but share it. Mm -hmm. Share the gospel. If you never learn, even believe it, if you don't know how to share the gospel, read the book. There are a lot of scriptures in that book that help you share, memorize them, share with people. So when you talk with people, you can use the word of God, not your words, not what you think. Not what you say, have to say, but what God said, because that's the only thing that the Holy Spirit can use, the word of God. Not my words, not your word. It's there. Yeah. The word of God is written on your heart. It yes. is. Incredible. Yes. Do you also have an audio version of this book? Yes, I do. It's uh, yeah. uh, uh, the number. Well, you can also find it on those platforms. Mm -hmm. And did you record the audio for this? No, the, the audio was recorded by a very nice guy. Uh, I forgot his name, man, but it's very nice. It's very nice. Because your voice is also, really, I would listen to your book from you. I would. 
I would even oh, listen to the, the audio Bible from your voice. It's very calming. It's very, it's very nice. Yeah, well, thank you, brother. The person that, uh, that did it, they did a very nice job. Wonderful job. And I, in fact, I, I listened to it over and over myself. And I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. And I read That's when you know it's good quality, myself. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just read it over and over and said, what could I have done? What could I have added to help people understand even better? So my goal is to, yes, I'm, I plan to write another book, uh, but I want to help believers with this book, help get them on the right track. That your main reason for being here is to be ambassadors for Christ, helping you to understand that you are a new creation. All of the things that you were about before, you can go on with the process of living, but your number one priority is to win people to Christ and build them up in the faith. That's what Christ is expecting for you. He's depending upon you to do that. And believers need to understand that. Amen. Well, Julius, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you joining our audience. If I can have you end our time together with a prayer, I would really appreciate it. Father, we thank you for Dallas. Just having me, giving me the opportunity to talk with him on this podcast. But there's a world out here that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die for. For he said that he came to seek and to save those that are lost. That was his primary purpose, trying to redeem us. Father, we pray that not only this book, but all books that will give people insight as to what I had for them and that there is hope people can be saved. They're being saved every day. And we thank you for Dallas and his wife who's out on the missionary field who laid down their life to give it all to you, to devote it to you. And we pray that they have much fruit from the time that they're spent in the field. For you said that the field is right is ready to be harvested. And he's out there diligently trying to do the work of Christ. We pray that you bless this world and save as many as possibly can be saved from this podcast, from the church, from anyone who speaks the name of Christ. We pray that you use it for thy glory and thy sake. In thy son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've just listened to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast with your host, Pastor Chris Busher. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast was recorded live in studio with final editing made before uploading. Subscribe today to Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. For more fantastic daily content, visit Pastor Chris Busher online via Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't miss the next episode on Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast.